Hello there everybody, Sam's Trains here, welcome back to the railway. You've probably seen my 3D printed working locomotive. It looks like this and it was hideous. Yes, I will be the very first to admit that. A lot of people have made fun of that thing and rightly so. But of course it wasn't intended to be a super detailed, realistic or in any way decent model. It was purely intended to demonstrate whether or not you could use a 3D printer, a cheap 3D printer, to produce a working locomotive. And I proved that you could and so that loco, as awful as it looked, was definitely a success in my book. However, ever since I started making 3D printer videos, people in the comments have been saying that FDM 3D printers like this are not capable of producing decent models, and that in order to get decent models you have to use a resin 3D printer. And yes, resin 3D printers obviously can produce much better models, however, I completely disagree that FDM printers cannot do a decent job too. Now maybe some of my videos have helped put around that rumour because models like this obviously aren't the best, but the thing is those models were produced very quickly, I designed them really quickly as a beginner, and I didn't even use the highest quality print settings for them. And so a couple of weeks ago I set myself a challenge to sit down and put some quality time into producing the best model I possibly could with a cheap £200 FDM 3D printer like this one. And this is what I came up with. And this is a Manning Wardle L-Class. It's an 060 saddle tank and this was produced entirely with the cheap FDM 3D printer. The only parts visible that you can see that were not 3D printed are the wheels and the whistle. Everything else came out of that printer. And actually this has come out way better than I expected it to. I am blown away by just what a little bit of hard work can do to a model. It has exceeded all of my expectations. And don't forget, I'm not a modeler, right? I've never built a locomotive kit before. I'm a complete beginner when it comes to this sort of thing. So if you're a serious modeler, if you've built kits and designed stuff before, imagine what you could do with a cheap 3D printer. So today I am going to be talking about the design of this model very briefly and how it came about but for the most part this video is going to be a review. I'm going to try to be as objective as I possibly can and review this as I would a proper model. Now obviously that is going to involve some pretty serious criticism of my own work because even though this looks half decent it's obviously not to the standard of a professional manufacturer still although it is the closest I've ever come. And also, obviously, doing a review of this thing will allow you guys to have a better view of this thing. I'll show you around it, show you some of the different details, talk about the mechanism, show you the performance, and it's just a nice opportunity to show this thing off properly for you. So on price, it's quite difficult to say what this thing cost me. I'm going to estimate 50 to 60 pounds. However, 40 pounds of that was the wheels. I had to buy Romford wheels for this because they were the best option and they were very, very expensive. However, if you're designing something that calls for a more standard size of wheel, you can buy wheels from the Hornby Spares department for sort of five, 10 pounds and you could save a lot of money. So the way I see this is that this cost me a lot less than it would if I was buying it from a manufacturer but I also got three weeks of pure joy and pleasure in designing and building and painting this thing which obviously you wouldn't get if you were just buying a loco so value for money seems pretty darn good 60 quid yes please so at the end of september this year 2021 i visited the black country museum in dudley which is an absolutely incredible museum it's just like stepping back in time amazing actors amazing location you've got to go if you can get down there but out front they have this locomotive a manning wardle l-class winston churchill now at this point I hadn't decided to make another locomotive yet but I did know that I was thinking about it and when I saw this loco standing out front and how great it looked I kind of decided yeah this might be my next project so very fortunately I decided to photograph it. Now I wasn't there for that long you know we were just having a drink before we went inside so I didn't have enough time to photograph it thoroughly but I took around 20 different photos and also the iPhone has a very basic measuring tool on it and even even though the measurements I don't think are 100% accurate, 
I did take some photos like this that give very rough indications of certain dimensions, such as the length of the water tanks, the diameter of the smoke box, or perhaps the diameter of the wheels, and also the general length of the loco. And to be honest, those values were very, very useful in designing the loco. And using those photos, I came up with this CAD design. This design took me around one solid week, so it was quite a long time, but as you can see, it's got all of the details included on the design there. Now, this model was never intended to be 100% realistic because personally, I'm not that interested in absolute accuracy. I just like locos that look nice, they've got a good level of detail, and they're a decent quality as well. So that's all I'm looking to do. However, I did put a lot of time into making sure all of the dimensions are roughly correct and most of the major details are there as well. Although there are one or two changes such as the addition of splashes, for instance, because the running plate on the real thing is hollow. It's not actually just a block, but on the model it does need to be a solid block because that gives the model a bit of weight and also a little bit of stability and rigidity. So it does have splashes, but some of the real Manning Wardle L-Class locos did have splashes as well but not Winston Churchill in real life. So yes, I do know that is slightly unrealistic. You don't have to comment me and tell me about that. Here's a look at the chassis design in CAD as well. Now I've decided to make the mechanism fit completely inside the water tank in order to leave the cab completely free for the detailing. So the next step was to produce a test print and here is the body from the test print. This was just literally done. I didn't paint it, I didn't sand it, I didn't do anything to it. I just took it off the printer and fitted all of the parts to it. And this was just to make sure the sides of all of the parts were okay. All of the little fitting holes were large enough to take the parts. And as you can see, most of the details here uh, fit quite nicely, which was really good news. And at this point, I went back to the Black Country Museum for another visit because you actually get a year's pass when you buy a ticket, so it's great value. And so I was able to take my little sample and take a few photos of it with the real thing. It's a pity I didn't have the fully painted one to take, but uh, this was as far as I'd got at that point. And so it was pretty nice for the little baby loco to meet its full-sized overlord. And maybe I'll take my painted one one day to introduce it to its daddy or something. Anyway, that's a bit of a tangent. So I thought I would use this sample just to demonstrate how the cab comes apart. So the roof comes off like this, and as you can see, quite a lot of detail inside the cab. And then the whole firebox with the controls on it slides out like so, and that means you can paint it and detail it away from the loco body. And when you've done that, you can just slip it in inside, which actually works amazingly well. I'm really, really happy with that. And the final firebox design for the proper model is a bit better than this. It's a bit more realistic, and it doesn't have that big square on the back, which makes it look even better. Right, so the video title did say that this was an unboxing and a review, so we need to see to the unboxing part, don't we? Okay, and now let's have a little bit of history on the class in real life. Manning Wardle was a manufacturer of steam locomotives based in Yorkshire, England, so not that far away. They produced a small range of locomotives for contracting work, and the L-Class was one such industrial design which was produced over quite a large number of years between 1881 and 1926, and quite a few different examples carried very different appearances too. Uh, some of them didn't even have enclosed cabs, which led to them having a completely different appearance. Despite the differences, all examples of the L-Class were of an 060 saddle tank formation, and this locomotive, Winston Churchill, is one of only two remaining examples, the other being Sir Berkeley, which I believe did have a different cab design, actually. Now, Winston was built right towards the end of the run of L-Class Locos in 1923, and it was owned by a small handful of different companies where it performed various different industrial duties until it was eventually donated to the Black Country Museum in the 1970s, where it is now on static display. So there she is up close and personal for you then, the Sam Strange 3D printed Manning Wardle L-Class. And I think these shots are going to be the cruelest on this loco because from any sort of distance, you know, the two meter rule, that sort of thing, this thing looks like, I know I pat myself on the back a little bit in saying this, but it does look like a professionally manufactured model, I think. 
But then when you start to look at it up close like this, the lack of finesse does become a little bit more apparent. So I'll talk about the elephant in the room, and that is the transfers that I've done on the side. Now, these are my own transfers that I designed, you know, on the computer and printed off and then transferred myself. And so the quality of the transferring isn't the greatest. In fact, you can probably see some bubbles behind the Winston Churchill lettering. Uh, I think that's just something that I'll have to improve on over time. But more importantly, you'll notice that the colour of the text is wrong. On the locomotive, it would have cream lettering, and here I've done it on black. Well, the reason is I don't have a way to print light colours. The printers I use are designed for white paper, and so they don't have white ink, because anything printed white is just left blank, and the paper, the white paper, shows through. Uh, so I just decided to do this in black. You'll also notice there is no lining on this loco as seen in the photos. But uh, again, I'm new to transfers. My friend Peter just recently showed me how to do it, but I'm not great at it and trying to get intricate lining on the thing would just not work. And it would be black and not cream anyway, so I decided against it. However, the lining appears to be a recent addition to the loco because if we look at this photo from a few years back, you can see it doesn't have any lining. So the lining only appeared recently when they repainted it, so not a huge deal. So let's talk about the finish then. Now, compared with some of the other 3D printed models I've produced in the past, the smoothness of the bodywork is really quite something. In fact, the cab roof shows this off best, I think. It's almost perfectly smooth. And the way I did this was by applying a coat or two of filler primer and then progressing through some very fine grit sandpapers all the way, I think, to 10,000 grit. And that produced this really nice smooth texture. There are one or two areas on the model where the layer lines are still visible. There are some areas that are hard to get to with sandpaper, but I think if I persevered next time, I'd be able to improve even more on the finish. But even so, with the use of a little bit of gloss varnish after painting, I've managed to get quite a nice shiny finish on most of the model, which I'm really pleased about. So let's take a look at some of the separately fitted parts. I think my absolute favourite are these little lunchboxy things on the side. <laughs> I've always just called them lunchboxes for some reason. But as you can see, I have been able to put a little transfer onto the side of those. I think those might be little builder's plates or something in real life. Uh, these just say S, the letter S. That's a bit self-important, isn't it? But yeah, that's all they say. And uh, they are separately fitted and therefore separately painted, which is pretty cool. Uh, then across the running plate, you've got the splashes, which appear on some Manning Wardle L classes, not this one in real life, but they appear on this model. And then you've got the separately fitted suspension springs above each wheel. And then you've got the pipework along the side of the boiler, which is actually really good and sturdy. You won't be able to break that off because it's attached to the body in four different places very firmly, which is good. And then you've got the separately fitted handrails, which are all 3D printed across the top of the tanks. And also, as you can see, these are all separately fitted um, handrail parts. And then if you look at the front of the smoke box, you can see I've got a little bit of detail going on there. And then quite a rudimentary separately fitted smoke box handle, which in real life has a bit more definition to it, obviously, but my model does not. So the buffer beams are something that I'm really proud of. These are very, very fine, as you can see, very slim parts. They are separately fitted, as are the buffers, but they're sadly not sprung. And in fact, I'm not sure if there would be any way to make them sprung, because as you can see, they line up with the running plate. So that wouldn't be too easy. Now, because these buffer beams are glued on, I reckon I've got one or two of them a little bit. Well, yeah, it's the back one, look. <laughs> you can see they point skywards very slightly. Uh, so, yeah, that's just my bad, unfortunately. I uh, should have done better with that, but I did not, so never mind. So the wheel set consists of the Romford wheels that I bought at great expense, and I've painted the centres black so that they don't stand out too much. And then you've got the 3D printed coupling rod, which is obviously not ideal. I'd much prefer it to be made of metal, but obviously that's just a limitation of the technology I've used. And then the pickup, I've used brass wire for the pickups, which I suppose could be painted black. That would probably be a good look, wouldn't it? Uh, they are visible, but they're hidden towards the bottom of the running plate. So if you look down on the model, you actually can't see those, which is what most people do. Anyway, around the other side, most of the detail is exactly the same, except there is a separately fitted reverser rod over there, which is pretty cool. And then we move on to the cab. So you've got the running number on the side of the cab as per the older livery of Winston Churchill. You've got the various separately fitted handrails and such on the side of the cab, as well as the suspension spring. 
really, really pleased with the way that looks. That is actually, those are just half suspension springs inside the cab, so as not to interfere with the firebox and the cab detail. But from outside, that, that detail is really nice. I'm really pleased with the way that came out. And then the cab interior is all painted up, so you can see we've got the sort of, it's a lot, in real life, it's a sort of metallic color on the upper part of the cab, and then plain black on the bottom, and I have replicated that. You've got the detailed firebox, as you can see, with the opening for the firebox door and all the controls molded or printed onto that. And then you've also got the red painted regulator rod there. That took a bit of a liberty with that, but I just wanted to paint it red because that is just, it looks nice when you look inside the cab. And then you've got the little brake handle or whatever it is painted in the back of the cab as well. There's a slight discrepancy between this and the real thing because on the real thing there'd be an opening into the coal bunker down there at the bottom i haven't done that on the model because that would be too complicated but i suppose i could if i wanted to but like i said earlier on not that bothered about absolute realism and then on the back you've got the openings for the windows no glazing as per the real thing but i suppose it would be easy to put some on if i wanted to you've got the separately fitted brackets on the back which probably would hold the fireman's tools that would be my guess. And then also you've got the coal load, which is separately fitted and therefore removable, but it is quite a snug fit, so I'm not going to remove it for you. And also an optional NEM coupling. That's just a NEM box. Unfortunately, that is a little bit too low. I didn't have any way to make that higher, so it is stuck at that height, unfortunately. But it does just about work, and it is removable. I think for the most part, I'm going to use this loco without a coupling anyway, because it looks better but I had to put one on there so I could demonstrate it hauling some wagons and such. So finally, let's finish off by talking about the paintwork, which was quite difficult on this because most of the body was a single piece. And to be honest, I think the masking has come out quite nicely. You've got quite a clean line along the running plate there, although maybe that won't look quite so good up close. I'm guessing probably not. And you've got these very, very fine areas of black around the bottom of the cab, which have also come out pretty well. I'm pleased with that. Same with the smoke box area, really. I think it's not perfect or anything, and I'd probably pick up on this if this was a professional, expensive model. But overall, I think it's not too bad, and I've definitely done worse, haven't I? So there it is. That is a close look at my 3D printed Manning Wardle locomotive. It's that classic case of not being a patch on the professionally manufactured models, but because I know the model so well and I've worked on every tiny part of it from scratch, I just feel a real connection to this loco that I haven't really felt with a lot of others. So yeah, obviously maybe I'm being too kind to it, but I hope that these close-ups have been truthful with you. I hope that they've showed you what the loco does well and what the loco perhaps doesn't do quite as well. But I hope you'll agree that it was, at the very least, worth doing. And it is amazing to know that I now have a Manning Wardle 060 saddle tank in my collection uh, that is completely unique. Maybe other more experienced kit builders have done a far better job. Maybe there are kits out there that have a lot more finesse on them and such. But this is mine, you know, warts and all. This is mine, and I'm very proud of it. So let's take it down onto the track. I will show you the performance. I will show you the mechanism. And to do that, I don't have to take this apart because I've got another chassis I can show you. So that should be good. Let's take a look. Okay, so there she is, Winston Churchill, down onto the track. That's strange to say, isn't it? Winston Churchill, a she? Oh, well, never mind. Anyway, this is what I meant about the sort of from a distance rule, because I think this is the optimum viewing distance, really. From back here, the thing looks absolutely fine, doesn't it? As long as you don't get too close. So it's on the track, it's ready to go. The most asked question I've had from people I've showed this to is which chassis are you using to run this thing? And of course the answer is I'm not using a pre-built chassis. This, this whole thing is custom built by me and that does include the chassis. So this is the chassis, it's my own design. Uh, this is it without the motor cover on so that you can see what's going on. Due to its size, I have gone for a coreless motor in here. Yes, I think that is very hypocritical, isn't it? Uh, but yeah, it's just necessary. They're efficient, they're they're small, they're really cheap, seemed like the best way to go. I have tried quite a few different cordless motors of this size. Some of them were super cheap, cost two pounds. Some of them were claimed to be special, you know, higher quality ones that were like 15, 16 pounds. I've tried all sorts. I can't tell the difference between the 16 and the two pound versions. So I'm gonna be using just the cheap ones from now on. I'm not saying there isn't a difference between the cheap and the more expensive ones. I'm just saying that if there was a difference, I couldn't notice it. 
The mechanism is very minimal due to its size. The thing runs on just two gears. As you can see, there's a one gear that fits here um, underneath the worm drive, and then another gear fitted to the center driving axle. The gearing isn't great, to be honest with you. The Loco is a bit faster than I'd like, but because it's a good coreless motor, it is still able to do a fairly good crawl, I think, which is pretty good. There is a motor cover, of course, that I made for this, and that just snaps right over the coreless motor, and that also serves to keep the intermediate gear in place, which I think is a pretty neat design. And then, of course, the body fits right on top, and that whole mechanism is in the tank area, basically, so it's nice and compact. On the underside, you can see there is space for some, I think they're 1.5 or 2 millimeter bearings, I forget now. But yeah, the thing does run on proper bearings, but they're on the actual model and not in this uh, spare chassis that I've got. And these are the pickups, they're made of brass wire. To be honest with you, the wire I've used here is too thick and it puts a bit too much pressure on the wheels, which stops the Loco from being ultra smooth. I have got some thinner gauge wire, which I'm going to eventually put onto this, and then I think the running will be silky smooth. But yeah, I do believe any unsmoothness is due to the pickups, which I'm hoping to fix. But as you can see, one of the pickup wires bends up into the chassis and that's how it connects to the motor. So again, really quite nice and tidy. And because the pickups touch the tops of the wheels, that leaves the model nice and serviceable so you can pull out the axles and such. And here's what it looks like with the base keeper plate uh, fitted on. You've got pass-through screws which go and hold the body onto the chassis and then four screws which hold the base keeper plate. So it's very, very simple. It's not over-engineered in any way and as a result it actually works even though it's 3D printed on a not that accurate machine. Obviously, this is not a heavy loco because it's not got any die-cast components. Even the chassis is made of plastic. However, when you consider that, it's actually not as light as you might expect. I printed all of these parts at high density, and so it does weigh in at 60 grams. It's not very heavy. It's not terribly heavy, but it's also not dreadfully light, and it is capable of hauling a few bits and bobs around. And that 60 grams does include only 5 grams of artificial, if you like, weight. There is a 5 gram weight in the top of the tank, uh, just above the chassis, because there was space for one. Okay, so, big question, the moment of truth. Does this thing run? Well, it did last time I checked. Here we go. <laughs> now, it's a little bit, yeah, it's not the smoothest. It's not terribly smooth, uh, but it is reasonably quiet and it is reliable. You know, it doesn't do a lot of cutting out and that sort of thing. Again, I think this is partly because of me being a beginner with this. I mean, I've never assembled a set of Romfords before. I do wonder whether one of them is a little bit wonky. You know, could be. But let me try and do a crawl for you. But like I say, with the better gauge of pickup wire, I reckon we could improve on this quite a bit. But I'm trying to crawl. Oh, trying to get it in the spot, yeah. So, I mean, that's comparable to a, you know, a proper model, isn't it? I think, obviously, we've seen better crawlers. But uh, to say the gearing isn't that efficient, I don't think that's too bad. And just to show you 50% speed, let's send it forwards at 50. Yeah, so I think it is a bit speedy. But like I say, there, just, there wasn't room to improve on the gearing. So what you've got is what you've got. I had a job to find gears that would be compatible with each other, let alone to fit an exact specification as for the gear ratios. But it's okay. I think it's better than nothing. And with a bit more space, I could have used some larger gears and geared it down better. But I don't think that's too much of a big deal. So let's get it running around the layout. And I'll just show you how it behaves on curves and such, just to prove that the thing doesn't derail all the time. Here we go. So yeah, it's perfectly reliable. I mean, from the very first time I put this chassis together, it ran without cutting out and causing problems. The first motor I put in there was a higher RPM coreless motor, and that was not good. It had no torque at the slow speed, and it went a bit like a pocket rocket. Uh, I think these are 13,000 RPM motors instead of 18,000. I think those are roughly the right figures, and they're much better. So if you're thinking of doing something like this yourself, uh, yeah, try to find the lower RPM ones. But yeah, as you can see, it's quite nice. A little bit, there is a bit of a wobble to it. Again, that could be due to the wobbly Romfords, could be due to the pickups, but I'm not too bothered, to be honest with you. It runs, it's reliable, doesn't cut out all the time, it doesn't derail. I'll take it, you know, I'll take it. And it gives me something to work on for next time. Uh, the next Loco I design will have to improve, it will have to, otherwise there's no point. So 
it will have to be nice and smooth, it'll have to be even quieter, it'll have to be capable of a better crawl, um, and I'll obviously have to spend some more time fettling the wheels, making sure everything's straight, but none of that really matters, because this just proves that you can do it, and I, you know, I'm not worried, because I know that with a bit more time, I could totally fix all of these issues, it's not going to be too much of a challenge. Okay, so time to be honest again then, because we've got to talk about pulling power. And the pulling power on this is not very good, to say the least. I've measured 0.04 newtons, which translates to around seven coaches, and I think that could be the worst pulling power I've ever measured of any loco. Now, obviously, if this was a professionally manufactured model, and it cost, you know, 100 or maybe more pounds these days, then obviously that would be completely unacceptable. But obviously in this case I was forced to use plastic for the running plate and for the chassis and so I guess I get a bit of a pass for that. That said though, imagine if the running plate was metal or even the chassis. That chassis made of metal, that would easily bring this thing up to over 100 grams and then it would be a fine hauler. Anyway, I've set up 10 open wagons with a towed brake van on the back, so that's 11 wagons. As a small industrial loco, I reckon if she can handle those, then we can give it at least a pass. So let's back up and let's see about the coupling. So I've fitted the NEM coupling, which is not a good design, by the way. It's just literally bodged on. Um, if I was going to do it properly, I'd want the coupling to be sort of further into the loco so that it doesn't stick out as much, but it was just a bit of an afterthought, really. Not a major part of the model, of course. Anyway, let's see. Can she haul 11 wagons? Yeah. All right, not too fast, because that's cheating. We'll go at like 30, 40, like that. There we go. Yeah, it seems to be all right, I suppose. <laughs> we'll see how it handles Gordon's Hill. Anyway, just to show you a little bit of a comparison between this and what I did last time, on the middle line, I am running the Monstrosity. I think we ought to just call it the Monstrosity, didn't we? So this was my first attempt at a 3D printed loco. There's a video popping up right now in the top corner, if you want to see it. Yeah, I mean, even if you really don't like the Manning Wardle that I've produced, you can't deny that this is far worse. <laughs> so there has been some sort of improvement and development. I think that's fair to say. I don't think that's too big-headed. And uh, yeah, give me a, a year or two and perhaps a resin printer, and then we'll really see what you can do with a 3D printer. But yeah, it's, it's all right. I'll always love this thing because it was the first loco that I saw through start to finish. And it does work nicely, we'll have to give it that, so yeah, it's a keeper, I think, just about. And then on the inside line, we have my only other 3D printed loco. This is the one that my friend Tom did, and I tell you what, if I ever get to be as good at painting models as Tom is, then I'll, the skies will be the limit, won't they, really? But yeah, much, much better paint job on this. But of course, this is just a Hornby chassis. It's not running on its own chassis. But uh, yeah, that's still kind of the goal, that sort of decoration. <laughs> right, let's head over to Gordon's Hill and see if the Manning Wardle can haul 10 wagons plus a brake van up it. Okay. I've got to say, it is running nicely, actually, except for the vibrations. It is a nice runner, I've got. It's, there's something quite cute about the way it runs, actually. I know, it just looks a little bit janky, a little bit dodgy. But that's okay, because it's reliable, right? So you're free to enjoy it. <laughs> but there we go, pants pulling power. And I will hold off saying it's done it until it goes around that corner, which it has. That curve, sorry. Been watching too much TV, curve, not corners. Uh, but yeah, it's done it. So I think that makes it fit for purpose. Because little industrial shunting locos and such, they ain't going to be hauling much more than that, so that's okay. And here's just a little go at an even slower speed, just to prove that there is enough torque there to actually sustain a run at the slower speeds. There you go. So, yeah, a little bit jerkier at the slower speeds, not the best. But it seems to do it okay without stopping or derailing. So I know it's still horrible, let's be honest, by modern standards and professional loco manufacturer standards. I think it's fair to say that this is still horrible, at least up close. But do you know what? To me at least, because I designed it and I've spent three weeks with it, that doesn't matter. This could come out, this could have come out as a complete non-runner 
none of the parts could have fitted together <laughs> and it could have looked like a pig with lipstick on but I would still love it right because it has been three weeks and I'm not exaggerating of just pure pleasure and joy and I was so disappointed when the thing was finished and there was nothing more to do to it um, that's probably why I'm, I'm looking to you know fix the NEM coupling and change the pickups just because I don't want to be finished with it I've had so much fun just messing around with it designing every part of it learning from it it's been such a challenge designing another chassis that was great fun that was really really great and it was a good challenge fitting it all into such a small form factor going online and buying the wheels and finding what would be closest to the original design and studying the photos and trying to get dimensions and measurements and choosing my paints and deciding how to do the transfers ah oh, it was just it's been an amazing project to say this was done on a 200 pound 3d printer is insane absolutely insane so you could literally buy a 3d printer and make this for the price of an expensive loco you know <laughs> seriously 250 quid some locos are these days well for that you could buy a cheap printer and get started making your own and the most incredible thing to me is that it seems like a really daunting task to do the cads and you know, design a whole model from scratch um, I suppose our industry has led us to believe that there's something terribly complex or difficult about it. But I really do believe with a tool like SketchUp, which is free to use, and a little bit of practice, anybody could do it. So if I can do it, who's never made a model in his life properly, then seriously, anybody can do it. I started learning CADs in April, I think it was, yeah, the end of April this year. And it's now November, and I've been able to do this. So if you think you're not good enough, if you think you, you don't have the skills, then nonsense, hogwash. If you're interested in doing it and you feel like it's something you would enjoy, then give it a few months, you know, an hour or so in the evening, just mess around, design a few wagons. You can do it, you can do it. If I can do it, you can do it. And you could probably do it quite a lot better as well. Because like I say, I'm no, I'm no good at modeling. I'm awful at modeling, <laughs> but it was fun to do and it was worth doing. So even though I've called this a review, it's not really a review, it's me just sort of showing something I've made disguised as a review, but I thought it would be a lot of fun to rate my Loco as I would rate a model that I've bought. Now, bear in mind, this Loco is a friend, right? It's been a friend of mine for the last three weeks. I've fallen in love with it, and like I say, even if it looked diabolical, which maybe to some it does, I would still absolutely love it because I've put so much time and effort into it. So, even though I'm making a conscious effort to be honest and accurate with my ratings, you may disagree with them, you may think I've been too harsh. Please comment down below what your ratings would be for this, that would be really interesting. But, from me trying to be as objective as possible, here are my ratings. So, let me try and explain how I arrived at these figures to anyone interested. So, for level of detail, I've given two and a half stars, middle of the road, it does have one or two nice details, right? I mean, the cab detail is pretty good. I, I love that I've been able to put some details in there. There's loads of separately fitted parts and such. And with the help of transfers and quality masking tape, I have been able to pull off a reasonably good finish, which is quite true to life, I suppose. But then again, there are areas of the model where the layer lines are visible. Obviously, the color of the text isn't quite right. The finesse of some of the smaller parts, particularly the pipework and the handrails, not quite up to proper manufacturer's standards. And because the mechanism is inside the water tanks, the lower boiler and the valve gear isn't modeled on this. So, yeah, it's not the greatest detail, of course, but for what it is, I suppose it's okay. Performance, I've given four star. I think this might be my most generous category, actually, uh, because it is a good crawler. You know, we saw it do quite a good crawl, and it is very reliable. It doesn't cut out, it doesn't derail, it handles all the curves okay, it doesn't slow down, it's consistent in its speed. Uh, but I can't give it five star because it wobbles a little bit, as you've seen, and it's not quite as smooth as some other locos. And in reverse, it's a bit noisier as well. So there's still some work to do on the performance, but overall, I think that's probably its strongest area. The pulling power is really bad, it's had to lose some marks for this. 0.04 newtons, that's about seven coaches. To be fair though, I mean, it's probably enough for it to do a realistic job of what it was designed to do in real life. So it's not too much of a problem, but it is much weaker than a model that you can buy. Mechanism then, again, I think, I think this is actually accurate. I think four star is fair for this mechanism. 
because it's got all-wheel pickup, all-wheel drive, proper bearings on the axles, a fairly good quality motor, all nice and neat and tidy, plenty of space for a decoder inside there. It would be no problem to wire in a decoder socket if you wanted to, plenty of space in that boiler for more. Uh, the only thing is it doesn't have a flywheel. Uh, it would have been really nice to have bought a nice little flywheel and popped it in there, but sadly there just wasn't space. Perhaps if I'd been willing to go into the cab a little bit more, and perhaps altered the firebox design to accept part of the mechanism in there, then maybe a flywheel would have been possible. But to be honest, the rest of this model isn't that highly finessed, so I think the lack of flywheel is the least of its problems. All right, so the quality is where this falls down. If this was a model I'd bought, I would not be very happy at all with the quality. So I've had to reflect that in the score and give it one and a half stars. Obviously, the fact that it's all plastic, even though that couldn't be helped in this case, uh, but that is a very, very big difference between this and a professional model. It needs, it really, really, at the very least, could do with a die-cast chassis. Uh, that would really fix most of the problems with it, I think, as well. Even better, die-cast running plate. That would have been really, really nice to have done, but obviously, I can't do that. You've got all plastic parts as well. Uh, quite a few of the parts are wonky. Yeah, there's no hiding it. You will have seen them during the close-up sections. Uh, I just need to get better at putting these things together, actually, but it's better than what I've done before. The finish is a bit inconsistent in some areas. I mean, if you could see those layer lines and dodgy areas on a professional model, you would not be pleased, would you? Uh, let's see, is there, is there any, there's not much good to say, let's be honest. There's not much good to say about the quality of this thing. It looks like a beginner's put it together and that's because that's exactly what's happened. Uh, the 1.5 then comes from the mechanism, which is half decent quality. Yeah, it's not bad quality mechanism, but that's about all you can say. Value for money then is a bit of a different story because I didn't just get a loco for the money I shelled out. I got three weeks of pure joy and learning and experience and everything for that money. Now it's hard to say whether 50 or 60 pounds is accurate because I used a few bits that I had around the house. I've used the PLA plastic that I've already got in stock. The whistle came out of my parts box. Uh, and there are other bits that I might have, like the bearings, I can't remember how much they cost, but they added you know, a few pence to it. So it's around 50 to 60 pounds, which I think is probably not great value if we're looking at it just as a loco, because I think a professional manufacturer could possibly have done slightly better than this for that price. I think that's fair to say. But for an 060 tank engine of this sort of size, generally that's a good price. And because I got all the fun and enjoyment out of it, I think that's good value. So I've given it four stars. I mean, if I could pay another 60 quid and have the three weeks that I've had again and get another unique loco out of it at the end of it, sign me up. It's a great deal, if you ask me. So I've given it four star. If you were to buy this for 60 quid, would it be a great deal? Perhaps not so much. But for me personally, for the experience I got, it's a four star value for money. So overall then, that is 5.8 out of 10. It's not a very flattering score, is it? And possibly even that is generous. But there it goes into the ranking, 46th place. It's not bottom, it is above the Adams 02. And I think that is just actually because the Adams 02 costs, what, twice as much as this. And there are elements of the design of the O2 which are actually, I think, objectively poorer than what I've been able to pull off with my cheap 3D printer. But also, obviously, it is perfectly fair that this is way down the ranking at 46th place because clearly it's nowhere near the standards of a professional manufacturer and I don't want anyone to leave this video thinking that that's what I'm trying to suggest because yes, this model is much closer than what I've been able to achieve before but it's still nowhere near at that standard but maybe one day we'll get there. So there we go, yep, 46th place above the O2, below the Backman Thomas. There you go. So there you go folks, that was honestly one of the best, again, yet again, one of the best experiences I've had in this hobby. And if there's anything to take away from this video for you, I would say don't be scared of giving it a try. You don't even have to buy a 3D printer to do this. You could sign up to SketchUp today for free and start designing and if you really wanted to bring what you've created into the real world, you can use a 3D printing service to have the models made for you. Uh, if not, 200 quid, cheap 3D printer, you can do the job. Uh, I can recommend the Mingda, the Mingda Magician X. That's what all of this model was done on, and it did a great job, and it's the cheapest 3D printer I've got. Uh, yeah, don't be frightened to give it a try. Things will go wrong, and look, you want things to go wrong. If nothing goes wrong, you never learn. You never learn from your mistakes. So if something doesn't work, celebrate. Think, yes, this is an opportunity to learn. This is an opportunity to find out what's wrong and fix it. 
And that is how you will improve and that's how you'll make better models. So yes, you'll be awful when you started. So was I, maybe I'm still awful now, that's very possible. But if you want it bad enough, you will improve and you will be able to do something decent. And to be honest, this loco meets my standards, right? To say I made this myself and to say how poor my skills are, I'm more than happy with this thing. I'm more than satisfied. So I hope you enjoyed this. Comment down below uh, what you thought. Have you got any suggestions on what I should do next? I'd love to do a diesel next of some description. Maybe not a, a Bobo or a Coco, but some sort of diesel. I did quite like not having to design a tender on this Manning Wardle, so maybe that's something I'll do next. But yeah, thanks for watching. Comment down below. Let me know what you thought. And sign up to SketchUp or download Blender or learn 3D modeling and you will enjoy it, honestly. It's the best thing I've done this year. It's the best thing I've done this decade, honestly. Really, really good fun. Okay, thanks for watching. See you soon.